Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, yesterday, John, for those of you who were here yesterday, John talked to us about wanting to challenge ourselves and sort of push ourselves in this work. And I just applaud that because I feel like if we don't challenge and push ourselves, then where does the transformation and the growth come from? And I have personally pushed myself by preparing a PowerPoint for this presentation <laughs> because I never use PowerPoint. We are, we're not friends. Um, so so if, we, if I fumble a little bit, you know it's just me growing and challenging myself, so please bear with me. Um, I, am, I am incredibly, incredibly honored to be here and to support the work of the Vermont Food Bank and of all of you, its partners and affiliates. I thank the organizers for inviting me to speak to you today. It is nothing short of a privilege to be able to stand in front of you and to share a little bit of my journey and experience working on food and in the hopes of sort of connecting with your journeys and thinking how we can collectively work together to end hunger in America today. I also want to thank each and every one of you for the work that you do day in and day out. You are literally at the front lines of what I consider to be a tremendous human rights struggle. And the work that you're doing I see as nothing short of doing the work of human rights activists and defenders. And I applaud you and I thank you. I believe that we're all here today because we're united and fueled by the idea and the belief that no one should go hungry. Is that fair to say? Yes. I want to talk to you today about our collective work to end hunger in America, which as I've said before, is something that I see as nothing short of a human rights struggle. But to understand why hunger is a human rights issue and why access to food is a fundamental human right, we first have to understand why hunger is such an injustice, why the fact of hunger is such an injustice. Um, for the sake of the social media plug, I put my Twitter, um, my Twitter handle up there. I also want to add another hashtag to those of you who are tweeting, which is the hashtag right to food. And if that's something that you look up, even on Twitter, you'll also see tremendous resources for folks who have been galvanizing all over the world to talk about and treat food and act on it like a human right, which I'm going to talk to you about today. I've lived in uh, a lot of different places and I've worked on these issues all over the world and I want to start by sharing a story of my work in India, where, which is where I was born, um, and where I've worked for almost two decades now against the atrocities committed in the name of caste and against the practice of untouchability in the caste system. How many of you are familiar with the caste system in India? Oh, great. I'm so glad to hear that. So, as many of you may know, caste-based atrocities continue to blight the lives of an estimated 200 million people in India today who are still deemed untouchable and who are treated as untouchables because they're considered so ritually polluting that they cannot be touched. They are made to live in segregated villages, they are made to perform extremely exploitative labor, and they are routinely abused at the hands of the police and of dominant caste groups who enjoy the state's protection. The caste system is alive and well in India, and it should come as no surprise that those who are at the bottom of it are also the ones who are the most hungry, the most dispossessed, the most deprived, the ones who have been thrown off their lands, are denied access to resources, and are made dependent on dominant caste groups to prop up what is essentially a powerful economic order that feeds itself through the cheap and forced labor of 200 million people. That's what's happening in India today, as we speak. And caste-based atrocities make national and sometimes international headlines all the time. When I started working on caste in India, it was um, not really making the international scene, and there wasn't a lot of attention that was being paid to it. And working together with a, a tremendously committed group of Dalit activists, I'm very happy to say that we actually changed that. But one of the things that required the most change, and something that I learned from that, is, and something that still continues to be a struggle in that work, is to get people to see something around them that they treated as so normal and so routine and so acceptable as an injustice. If you ask me what is the biggest hurdle to ensuring the rights of 200 million people in India today, the hurdle is shifting consciousness. We have so many laws 
they don't get implemented. We have so many struggles and fights and they get beaten down all the time. Why? Because there is a lack of consciousness. And in India, and in many other parts of the world where caste systems exist, that consciousness is one where people just believe and are indoctrinated with the idea from birth to death that some people are of lesser value, that some people, that there is a hierarchy of value in people, and some people are made to be untouchable and deserve the treatment that, they, that is meted out in the most inhuman and brutal terms. So a lot of the work that um, still remains to be done in the Dalit rights movement today is not only organizing Dalit communities to be able to stand up and, and lead the movement for their rights, but also to shift the consciousness of the community at large that stops and finally says, this is unacceptable. You know, it's about turning a mirror back on yourself and saying, what does it mean that we as a, as a society, as the world's largest democracy, as India is often called, tolerates this level of inhumanity and abuse? And not only tolerates it, but benefits deeply, deeply from it. I'm not, I don't come from a Dalit background, which is the, so -called, um, the name of so-called untouchable. So in doing that work, I also had to deeply confront my own caste privilege and ask myself again and again, well, if there's so much suffering, it must be because there's so many people who are benefiting from it. How am I benefiting? And how can I use my caste privilege and all sorts of other privilege that I have and exercise it with responsibility to putting to end this abomination? The reason I start this conversation about food in the United States with a conversation about caste in India is because I think we're facing the same problem here. I think we're facing a problem of a lack of consciousness. And I think what's needed before we get to the systems change and the culture change that is so critical that John is talking about is we need to shift our consciousness. We need to shake up our complacency and just say enough is enough. That it's not okay that one in seven Americans, one in seven people in the richest, wealthiest, most powerful country in the world is struggling to put food on the table. To me, that is a deep injustice. It is a deeply moral issue, and it's also an issue that has a solution that is actually very, very in, much in our grasp. But first, in order to end an injustice, we first have to see it as unjust. And I think a lot of the problem is seeing these issues as unjust. And I'm preaching to the choir in, in some respects, I know. But I think it, it bears repeating that how we think about food, how we talk about food, makes a huge difference in how we see ourselves, how we see our societies, how we see the change that we're seeking, and how we see the individuals who are coming through your doors every single day at the brunt end of these abuses and how it is that we treat those individuals and how we work with them and each other to inspire that kind of change. So that's, that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, if that's okay. Um, and I want to talk by saying a little bit about sort of the big picture of hunger in the United States. And I think many of you know the statistics, but I think they're sort of bare, they bear repeating. As I already said, one in seven Americans is food insecure meaning they're often forced to skip meals, eat less at meals, buy cheap unhealthy food, and or feed their children but not themselves. To me, even the language of food insecurity is a very sanitized way of saying that 46 million Americans are living a daily nightmare and facing a perpetual crisis when it comes to their food and having to make trade-offs that no one should have to make, no one anywhere should have to make. 6.9 million U.S. households suffer from severe food insecurity, which means the people who live in these households are often hungry. I've done this work all around the world, and people ask me, well, isn't the problem so much greater elsewhere? Well, sure, there's more people elsewhere, but there's something really, there's a, there's a senselessness, and even more of a moral outrage in my mind, when there is so much resources, when there is so much to go around, and when so many people are wanting. That to me is almost a, a greater outrage and, and when I turned my work to coming to the United States I started learning a lot of things both about the extent of hunger, its impacts on our society and also um, started thinking about the ways in which we can shift our consciousness in how we deal with it today. There's no corner in the of this country where hunger is not a problem as many of you know. In the 2012 to 2014 period state food insecurity rates range from 22% of Mississippi households to 8.4% of North Dakota households. And right here in Vermont, 13% of households are food insecure. 
That's 80,000 Vermonters struggling to put food on the table, 20,000 of whom are children, and 6% of Vermont households suffer from food, severe food insecurity, experiencing hunger on a regular basis. And you know that no less than one in four Vermonters um, ends up, uh, com is, comes to use the services, <coughs> that, the incredible service that you are providing. You know, these statistics are numbing. I, I talk about statistics all the time, and it's very hard, it's actually very hard to enter enter a conversation if you don't sort of make yourself familiar with the people who are behind it. So I wanted to get back sort of some, go from a little bit of the numbness of this to tell some stories, because stories are real, and I'm going to tell a few stories that reveal the injustice of hunger. These stories and photographs are courtesy of the organization Mazone, a Jewish response to hunger, and they were featured in our report that Janet cited that's called Nourishing Change, Fulfilling the Right to Food in the United States. I actually have a few copies with me, but it's also available online, and I would um, welcome you and encourage you to seek it out and download it and take a look. This is Emery in his front yard in Brandon, Mississippi. Emery lost his home as a result of the recession. Being unemployed cut Emery's household income in half, and along with his wife, he now struggles to pay the mortgage and has to make tough decisions about to how to allocate the little money that they have. Are we going to eat or are we going to pay the light bill? They ask themselves. They've changed how they feed themselves. <coughs> I like fish a lot, Emery said, but now we can't afford it. Last night for dinner, I ate some crackers and cheese and some kind of, shall we say, processed meat. Emery is a veteran. Emery fought for his country, and now he's battling hunger and food insecurity. Emery's not alone. There's one study that showed that more than one in four veterans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan are food insecure. We have endless money for wars, but not to take care of those who put their lives on the line when they go to the battlefronts to lead them. That, to me, is a deep injustice. How many of you have served veterans like Emery? A lot of you. Thank you. And how many of you work with people who have to make impossible trade-offs? Most of you. This is John. It's, he's outside of his home in Canton, Michigan. John is 10 years old and he really wishes he could have a paper route so that he could bring some income to and help his family pay the rent and get enough food. John said that he feels really sad when his parents feed the kids, but they don't feed themselves. And he says, Mom, if you're not getting yourself something, then I'm not getting anything. Before John's family got on SNAP, formerly known as food stamps, John would get so hungry that it hurt his stomach and made him feel out of breath. He used to get grades, but then his grades started plummeting because he just simply couldn't concentrate in school because of his hunger. He's now at a school that has a school breakfast and lunch program, and these programs are making a world of difference to John and to so many other kids. John is one of 15.3 million children who are going hungry in America today. That's one in five children. We are now at a point where the majority of children in public schools in America live in poverty. A majority of children in public schools in this country live in poverty. We have enough to subsidize corporations to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars in the form of tax breaks and other breaks, even in the midst of major government cuts but not enough to ensure that children aren't living in poverty and have enough food in their stomachs so that they can learn, so that they can flourish, they can be nourished and they can grow. That, to me, is an injustice. How many of you are serving children like John? How many of you are packing backpacks on Friday so that people have enough food to eat at home over the weekends? This is Tiffany. Tiffany, with the, uh, she's with two of her three daughters in their living room in Jackson, Mississippi. She's under doctor's orders not to work while she undergoes medical treatment. And as a result, she's on disability and she's on SNAP. I know a lot of people who look down on me, she says. But if I didn't get help, we'd be homeless and I wouldn't be able to feed my girls. I've always known how to manage my money, but now I come up short every month. My food stamps are depleted after maybe two and a half weeks. That's when our cupboards become bare and I start to worry about where our next meal is coming from. The first thing my daughters do when they come home from school is look in the fridge and say, well, mom, we don't have this and we don't have that. I hear those words and I feel like I'm not providing for my children. Tiffany feels a deep sense of shame. And she's made to feel bad that she needs assistance because she has a medical disability. That, to me, is an injustice. How many of you are serving individuals with medical disabilities like Tiffany? Many of you. How many of you are serving individuals who feel a deep sense of shame? Look around you. People are feeling so ashamed 
at the end of, um, for being at the end of such deep, deep injustices? Are they the ones who should be feeling that shame? No. no. This is Jessica with her family and her trailer in Pine Ridge Res Reservation in South Dakota. Her husband was a 4.0 student and he works full time as a dishwasher, which is considered a very high paying job around where they live, but it's not enough to make ends meet. I'd love to get off food stamps, Jessica said. I'd really like to be able to just go to the store and buy everything we need. But the only we can get off food stamps is if we find some real economic stability. Jessica's husband is one of millions of Americans working full time but still unable to make ends meet. And that's because he's not earning a living wage. He's earning poverty wages. An overwhelming majority of SNAP recipients either cannot work because they are disabled, they are elderly, they are children, um, or they are sick, or they do work. And some of them even two jobs, but they're not earning a living wage. They're earning poverty wages. That, to me, is an injustice. How many of you have served people who are working full-time jobs but unable to make ends meet? Again, so many of you. <coughs> Underemployment, stagnant wages, and a rising cost of living are key factors that are fueling food security, insecurity and hunger today. And finally, this is Marilyn at her kitchen table. We've just spoken about seniors a bit. She also lives in South Dakota. And this is what Marilyn had to say. My life as a senior citizen is probably harder than any other time in my life. Living on a fixed income from Social Security, my husband and I had to adjust from what we use to what we have now. My priority is to pay for my meds and for my husband and myself because we need them to stay alive. There's, that leaves very little money to buy food. I'm not happy we have to give up nourishment for medicine. I recently bought a few tomatoes for $2.89. I just wanted some taste to add to the lettuce. I cut them up really small and used a bit at a time. Usually we just don't consume vegetables unless they come out of a can. Marilyn is one of nearly five million seniors who are food insecure, and like so many others, she has to choose between buying food or buying life-saving medicine. That is an injustice. How many of you serve clients who are seniors? Again, so many of you. As these stories and as your own experiences make clear, hunger affects a broad range of Americans, including working Americans and families who live above the U.S. poverty guidelines. But of course, there are families that are particularly hard hit, and that includes those living below the poverty line, it includes rural households, it includes households headed by single mothers, and it includes black and Hispanic households who are disproportion disproportionately poor and therefore disproportionately hungry. Hunger is the end result of grave social injustices, including centuries of racial and gender-based subjugation. It is not a coincidence that communities of color in this country are disproportionately poor and therefore disproportionately hungry. It is the end result of injustice. It is not a coincidence that single mothers and women in particular struggle with hunger. It is the end result of gender-based subjugation, of a lack of equal pay for women, among other things. We also have a food system that is generating hunger, and I think that's important to point out, and I'll be talking about our food system a bit. The vast majority of people who pick, grow, and process our food live in poverty and cannot afford to buy adequate healthy food. And that's actually a fact that is true the world over. The majority of the people who go hungry in the world today are somehow involved in the production, processing, or selling of our food. That's an enormous indictment of our food system and the hands that go into the soil, that pick our food, that wash our food, that prepare our food, that sell us our food, are the same hands that are struggling to feed their own families. And that's not a coincidence either. That's the coincidence of a deep imbalance of power in our food systems where a handful, in a, a handful of agribusiness corporations exert immense control and power over the retail processing, uh, processing and production of our food, while those who are at the other end of the food chain are the most food insecure. Five of the eight lowest paying jobs in the country are in the food system, and 86% of farm and food workers report wages that are either at or below the poverty level. My point of sharing all these statistics is to say one simple thought, which is people are not just poor, they're being impoverished. They're being impoverished. There's an act behind it. There's an impoverishment that is taking place. There is an act of power, an economic benefit that's being derived to someone behind it. And I choose my words very carefully when I talk about poverty in the United States or elsewhere. People, not, people are not poor by chance, they are poor by design. 
the design of our economic system. The people are not hungry by chance, they are hungry by design, including the design of our food system. That's the crisis that we're facing. That's the crisis that lands at your door. And the impacts of that crisis are deep and enormous. The first is the health impact, which we've already started speaking to. Food insecurity intersects with and fuels our epidemic of obesity and other public health crises in this country. Why? Why is the picture of food insecurity also a picture of obesity and a picture of a public health nightmare? Well, that's because Americans have to make trade-offs between the quality of their food and the quantity of their food. And I wanted to share this one graph to bring that point home. It's a graph that shows what, on average, $3 will buy today. $3 will, on average, buy 3,767 calories of processed food, but only 312 calories of fresh fruits and vegetables. That's the purchasing power we have today. Supermarkets, convenience stores, and fast food outlets offer an endless array of cheap and processed junk foods. Meanwhile, fresh fruits and vegetables or unhealthy prepared foods are unaffordable for many Americans. And in many neighborhoods, they're really hard to find and simply out of reach. An estimated 23.5 million Americans live over a mile away from a grocery store that actually has a variety of fresh produce to sell. Why is that? Why is it so much easier to buy cheap processed foods? Food doesn't grow with a price tag on it. It doesn't come into the world announcing that this is how much it costs. It's the result of food policies. It's the result of what we choose to subsidize and what we don't choose to support. It's the subsidizing of all the food commodities that go into the production of the Happy Meal that make it so affordable, and the lack of attention to small-scale farmers doing organic work, producing food, doing the tremendous work that's happening in Vermont um, that leads to an outcome where this is the decision that food insecure communities are having to make. And the consequences are deep. Um, the consequences on our health are astounding, which can be seen right here in Vermont. 72% of individuals serviced by the Vermont Food Bank report having to purchase cheaper and healthy food in order to provide enough food for their household. One in three households has a member living with diabetes. 46% report high blood pressure. In addition to dealing with ongoing health issues, they're struggling with rising medical costs. So you can see easily the vicious cycle that's produced. One of poverty, leading to food insecurity, leading to having to purchase cheap processed food, leading to obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, leading to rising medical costs, leading to greater poverty. It's a trap, and we've trapped way too many Americans in it. Food insecurity also takes a real toll on children, and we've already started talking a little bit about children and on families, and on the health and education outcomes of children. Children who don't receive adequate nutrition, including when they're in their mother's bellies. Um, are at risk of serious health, health problems and at risk of hospitalization. Children who are hungry struggle to learn, children like John. Children who experience chronic hunger are also much li more likely to experience behavioral problems and to need mental health counseling. There's a deep psychological <coughs> impact that's taking place that I don't think is talked about enough, at least in the circles that I'm in. What are we doing to the psyche of an entire generation of children? What are we doing to the social fabric when they are so hungry that they cannot learn, when they lead to these behavioral problems. And all of these possible problems connected to food insecurity increase the chance that children will drop out of high school, potentially decreasing their lifetime earning potential, and again trapping them in this vicious, vicious cycle of poverty. For the first time in a century, children born in the 2000s had a lower life expectancy than their parents. A lower life expectancy than their parents and that's thanks to the spiking rates of obesity and diet-related diseases, adding billions of dollars each year to our national health care bill. And that brings me to the other impact, which is that food insecurity is really expensive for our society. The Center for American Progress estimated in 2010 that the cost of hunger and food insecurity in America amounted to $167.5 billion. And that included the cost <coughs> which was a conservative estimate of treating all these illnesses, of running emergency food provider programs, and of the loss of lifetime earning potential, and of running charity-based emergency food programs. Overall, the center also estimated that it would have cost the government just half that amount, or $83 billion, to simply extend SNAP to all food insecure households. That's the crisis we're facing. It's deep, 
It's widespread and its impacts will likely be felt for generations to come, not only on our children, on our bodies, but on our environment too. I don't have to tell you that the dominant food system that we are in is doing deep, deep damage to our ecology and to our environment. Industrial agricultural production is a major driver of climate change, of polluting our waterways, and, uh, and a deep driver of many of the problems that we're seeing in ecological ways in the world today. So what's the government's, that's the extent of the problem. So then it makes it, okay, so that's just laid there, which I feel is a deep result of, of injustices. What is our government's response to this problem? Nutrition assistance programs that many of you know about. SNAP, which reaches one in seven Americans every month. The WIC program, did you know that more than half of infants born in the United States each year benefit from WIC? The National School Lunch Program, serving more than 30 million children daily. And the School Breakfast Program, which serves more than 11.7 million children. Um, and as you know, here in Vermont, um, it's called Three Squares Vermont. Is that right? The yeah. program, which I know also serves many, but, but not doesn't reach everybody, which I'll come to. These and other programs are extremely critical to the health and well-being of millions of Americans and are literally lifting them and keeping them out of poverty. But our research shows that they fall short in three key respects. The first is that eligibility requirements are drawn very narrowly. So there's a lot of food insecure families and people who just aren't deemed eligible. People like Emery, the veteran that I shared with you, um, whose story I shared with you in the beginning, he simply falls out of the eligibility guidelines, so he's not qualified to receive assistance. There are also others who face tremendous new, um, administrative barriers to participation. It's simply, I don't know how it works in Vermont, but all over the country I've spoken to people where just getting the benefit is a real pain and extremely hard. It's not made easy. And also people feel a deep sense of stigma and shame for asking for some, this entitlement, for claiming their human rights in my mind, which also keeps many people away. And lastly, the benefits are simply insufficient. The average benefit on SNAP is $1.50 per person per meal. Think about what $1.50 would buy you. Remember that graph. Remember Marilyn spending $2.89 on tomatoes and cutting them up really small just so that she could add some taste to her lettuce. This, um, they're simply insufficient. And as Tiffany said, by the, they just don't last. So by the third week of the month, her cupboards are bare. So these are some of the gaps in our food safety net. And there's millions of people who benefit, but also millions who are falling through the cracks and for whom it's just not doing enough. And who is who are catching the people who are falling through the cracks of our food safety net? We are. You are. You are. And thank goodness for you. Thank goodness for being here and all that you do. I also want to place it in these terms because I want you to see where you're coming into in this system. Emergency food providers, charitable food providers, are given you're given different names. But emergency food has become a routine source of food for 46 million Americans today. That's the statistic that Feeding America says. That's the number of Americans that Feeding America and all of its networks and affiliates serve. There's something profoundly wrong with the idea that 46 million Americans now turn to emergency food supplies as a routine source of their food. Deep-seated injustice, poverty, and economic inequality is no longer, um, it's not an emergency, it's just the way things are now. And to me, there's something about our consciousness that needs to shift and sort of wake up and see something deeply and profoundly wrong with that. Emergency food providers are critical to the daily survival and ability for people to be able to provide for themselves. You are critical for that. And I don't know what's happening here, but I'll tell you in other places that I've been, food providers are also being stretched to the limit and they cannot make up for the shortcomings of the Nutrition Assistance Program or for the deep-seated systemic injustices in our economy and our society. A lot of people I've talked to are tired of measuring success by the pounds that they've distributed. <coughs> Many are seeking a different kind of approach, a different kind of change. How many of you feel like the onslaught just keeps coming in? Yeah. Yeah. And you're not the only ones. This is customers waiting in line outside um, a food pantry in Chicago. And this is my hometown, my backyard right here in New York City. That's 2013. It's an old photo, but that would be true even today. In the financial capital of the world, people are lining outside to food pantries. A few years
years ago, we had the opportunity to fix these problems with our food system through the 2014 Farm Bill. If many of you worked with the Farm Bill, and as many of you know all about the Farm Bill. Um, Congress could have expanded eligibility, enhanced benefits, and reduced the administrative barriers. But what did, what did it do instead? Well, it spent, first they spent months debating how many billions of dollars to cut from the food safety net over the next 10 years. Was it $4 billion as one version of the bill or $40 billion? In other words, they were actively debating how many millions of Americans they should throw into deeper crisis. And as many of you know, the Farm Bill was signed into law in February of 2014 with $8.6 billion in SNAP cuts, which cut benefits to an estimated 850,000 households by an average of $90 per month. For families that are trying to get by on $1.50 per meal, that's 60 fewer meals per month. At a time when struggling, Americans are struggling more than ever and need these benefits the most, they were pushed into deeper crisis. I started off by saying that hunger in America is not the result of shortage of food or resources. Um, it is the direct result of poverty, perpetuated through policies that fail to prioritize Americans' most fundamental needs. Hen ending hunger is not a political priority in this country. And as John has already said, that is a deep moral failing. I've worked in many places where we have the excuse of a lack of resources, where we have an excuse of, of, uh, of war, where there is an excuse of, of something so traumatic happening that people simply cannot physically get to the food that is around them. We don't have that excuse here. And to me, that makes it even more breathtaking. We also continue to lack a systematic approach to tackling hunger and poverty, which I want to come to because we're talking about systems change and what it will actually take to systematically address the issue so that you're not all sitting here in the same situation that we're sitting in and that we can actually get to the root cause of these issues. The fact that the U.S. doesn't have a strategy is also in stark contrast to how other nations in the world are behaving, and there are many countries that are not doing well here. I don't, want to, I don't want to pretend that there aren't massive human rights issues in many parts of the world. But also in many parts of the world, uh, governments came together to commit to ending hung, to cutting the proportion of people who suffered from hunger by half in 2015. It was called the Millennium Development Goals. They came together in 2000 to do that. And a remarkable number of countries, not, not all of them, made significant progress towards doing that. In that same time period, between 1990 and, or 2000 and 2015, Many countries actually work to reduce the proportion of people who are hungry by 50%. Here in America, we went in the opposite direction. Both before and after the recession, the number of hungry people has not significantly declined. And that also points to a lack of political will to actually take the issue at its root and to do something about it. I mention what other countries are doing because I think it's important. I think it's important to sort of situate yourself in the global economy, in the context of other nations, not to say, one is better or one is worse. I can talk about a lot of abuses in other parts of the world that don't happen here. But to say, what kind of a food movement do we want to be a part of? What kind of a political system do we want to be a part of? And what are the things that we want to fight for? And can we not do what so many countries in Latin America are doing for their hungry population? Are we not equipped to do those same things? So then, may I have some water, please? Thank you. So then I think the question becomes, why? And that goes back to what I was saying in the beginning. Why is it that with all these resources, with technology, with, with all the resources that we have, we still continue to have this problem? Thank you. And the answer is what I said in the beginning, is because we simply don't see this as an issue of justice. We don't see this as a, an issue that we systematically have to move our consciousness around and we have to move our communities around. So I do think it's time for a new approach, um, an approach that was actually born of and inspired by visionaries in the United States, among others. I think it's time to start talking about food as a human right. And I like talking about food as a human right because it's a means of shifting consciousness. So let's start talking about the right to food, a new way of thinking. What is the right to food? I'll give you a moment to read what's on the screen. right to food is the right of all people to be free from hunger and to have physical and economic access at all times to sufficient, nutritious, and culturally acceptable food that is produced sustainably 
preserving access to food for future generations. To break that down, a rights-based approach to food emphasizes the obligations of our governments to ensure that food is accessible, which means both economic accessibility and physical accessibility. Economic accessibility means that people shouldn't have to make the kinds of trade-offs between food and life-saving medicine and the other trade-offs that we described. Physical accessibility means that people should be able to physically um, reach food in food stores, including those who are most vulnerable in our society. But it's not just any kind of food that we're talking about. We're not just talking about stuffing our faces with empty calories. There's also concern about the adequacy of food. And the example of foods that I talked about before, the energy-dense but nutrient-poor foods that are lining our supermarkets are examples of inadequate food. So we're not just talking about accessibility to food, but we're talking about <coughs> nourishment. Nourishment, is food entering our body as poison, or is it entering our body as nourishing, nourishing medicine? The right to food cares about that as well. And thirdly, food must be available to purchase in stores, or people must have the means to produce food themselves, including through secure access to land, water, and seeds. This is a tremendous issue and a tremendous part of food justice movements and food system sustainability. It's not just about outsourcing the production, but do we have access to the resources, especially young farmers today who need to step in and fill some huge shoes as there's a massive transition in farming in this country. Do they have access to the land, to the seed? What about our water supplies? That's a huge issue in our country right now. Do they have enough water? Is that water clean enough for us to be producing food from it? These are all part of what we have to think about when we talk about food. And finally, food has to be produced and consumed sustainably so that we can preserve this right for future generations. We don't have a problem with food production right now. We actually produce much more, we actually waste more food than the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa produces in a year. We waste more food than the entirety of Sub-Saharan Africa produces in a year. The problem is distribution. The problem is access. The problem is dismantling social and economic injustices so that people have access to food. But down the line, production is going to be a problem because we are tearing apart the soil and the land and the very means of how we produce our food. So thinking about how we produce food, including using sustainable, small-scale agroecological practices is also extremely important. So that's the right to food. And to me, that feels like an incredibly amazing idea. And it's not just about the right to a minimum number of calories. When I look at that and I look at the right to food, what I'm looking at is a right for a political and economic system where people are empowered to provide for themselves with nourishment and with dignity. Dignity is a huge part of this conversation. So much of what we are stripped of when we're thrown into these modes is a sense of dignity, a sense of agency over our lives, a sense of being able to say that we have provided for our families, and a sense of just feeling good. How awful do you feel when you eat the wrong thing? How awful does that feel? and the desire to be more connected, to just feel closer to the food. Food is how the energy of the planet enters our body. By the time it's packaged and processed into cans, it's gone through a lot of things that are very far removed from the nourishment of this planet and the ecology that is here to heal us. It's a profoundly profound right, and it's an amazing idea that brings into focus not only the injustices, but all of the things that we want as a society and as a community. It's a right that also is not foreign, and I get this all the time, well that's about international law, that's about what's happening elsewhere, that's not what we think. It's an idea that was born of the um, Roosevelt administration wanting to ensure freedom from want during the Great Depression. And Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady at the time, was the architect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There she is holding that declaration, which is the document from which this idea was born. And it's traveled to all these other international treaties. It's been interpreted over time. <coughs> Civil society movements and peasants' rights struggles all over the world have caught on to the idea and have made it and shaped it into this very transformative tool that it is today. And now it's seeping into constitutions all over the world and it's becoming a legal right. And I was talking to our friends from Maine last night telling, who were talking to me about how the right to food has been introduced in the state constitution of Maine. There's a big uphill battle there, but this is also <coughs> happening all around us today. But I'm not just talking to you about the legal right. As I said before, I'm talking to you about shifting the way that we think about things and thinking about what our relationships are to one another and thinking about what our government's responsibility looks like. So I like talking about food as a human right because 
It helps name hunger as an injustice. And as I said, it's very difficult to fix an injustice if you don't first see it as unjust. It also helps clarify that people arrive at hunger by way of grave injustice that are social, economic, and political in nature, and sometimes centuries old, including centuries of racial and gender-based subjugation. It also demands a systemic response, not a piecemeal, fractured, incomplete response, but a systemic response. So when you take this and you sort of put it in front of government, you say, what is it that we're actually looking for as a systemic response? Here are some ideas that have come up. <coughs> We're asking the government to ensure a living wage. And this comes back to what I said before. It's a right to a political and economic system where people are empowered to provide for themselves. That is a fundamental paradigm shift. It is not the question of how can we feed people. How can we empower people to feed themselves with dignity, nourishment, love, with love and in a sustainable, sustainable way. And for those who are unable to provide for themselves because they are sick, they are elderly, or for any reason at all, how do we strengthen our food safety net and our social safety net generally so that no one is falling through the cracks? And we've made a lot of recommendations, and so have others, about revising eligibility requirements, increasing benefits, increasing participation in school meals programs, and also reducing stigma, which is a huge, huge part of this. Stop calling people who are recipients or who are claiming their rights members of a lazy dependency class. That is literally how SNAP recipients are talked about by certain members of our government. And it's a, it's a shameful, shameful way to talk about people who are claiming the rights and who are at the butt end of these injustices. We also need to fix our broken food system. We need a food system where every American has access to healthy, affordable food that is fair to food workers, good for the environment, and improves farmers' livelihoods. What does it say about us as a society when we treat the hands that feed us in such a poor, poor way. When we poison the environment to put food on the table, that poison then enters our bodies and you see it. You see it in the fracturing of our public health. You see it in how we interact with one another. What would it look like to have a food system that was sustainable, that was nourishing, and that was just? Those are the questions that are being asked. And there's a lot of movement right now to also get a national, to simply get a national food policy. We are lacking a national food policy that connects all these dots between our health, our education, our agricultural policies, and food insecurity and economic injustice in this country. So that's the right to food. And that is, those are some of the recommendations that come and are born out of this framework and this way of looking at things. But why I like looking at the right to food, and I want to sort of bring it back to this room again, and this is where I'll conclude, is, is for me, I'll conclude where I started. This is really about how we see ourselves, how we see our societies, and how we see the people that we are serving and on whose behalf we are doing this work. How do we see Tiffany, Emery, John, Marilyn, and Jessica? Do we see them as members of a dependency class, as lazy recipients of government aid? Or do we see them as rights holders, victims of human rights injustices who themselves can lead a movement for social change? Those are very, very different paradigms and very different ways to look at people. How do we see our government and its responsibilities? Are we holding our government accountable for these mass, this mass deprivation, for not prioritizing Americans' most fundamental needs when there are plenty of resources to go around? And how do we see ourselves? I think maybe that's the most important conversation. And it's, it's a conversation that I, I started off talking about myself and my own journey because I think it's a really important way of bringing ourselves and how we view ourselves in this conversation. I see all of you as human rights defenders. Do you see yourself that way? Yeah. I see you at the front line of a struggle whose time has come. There was a time where racial segregation, slavery, so much was just perfectly accepted as the norm. Where caste systems were perfectly accepted as the norm, that time came. And we're still fighting those fights in many, many significant ways. Is it now the time to demand food as a human right? Has that time come? I think so. I think so, very deeply. And it all comes back to shifting consciousness and asking the question, how do you shift consciousness in the face of so much injustice? How do you achieve social transformation?
The title of this conference, which is also very much the title of our report, is about nourishing change. We want change. We want to be nourished by that change. We're all here because we're seeking change in it, and because we are looking for nourishment for our mind, for our bodies, our souls, our planet, our communities, and this is not an us and them. If we have a broken food system, if we have so much deprivation amongst us, it affects us deeply. It calls on us to act in deep, significant, transformational ways. So how does that begin? How do we move beyond and, and be, be beyond being service providers, um, which is still so, so important, to also becoming agents of social change? I think that's a critical question, and I think that the only way that we transform is to by making things personal. Make this very, very personal for yourself. You need to make a personal commitment. We all need to make a personal commitment. You already do. Let me just say, you show up every day and do things that so many have just turned a blind eye to. We need to make a personal commitment to first and foremost challenge ourselves. Challenge the systems that we're operating in. Challenge how we see ourselves. Challenge how we see our economies challenge how we see the people that we are doing this work for. We have to think critically. Think critically. Also, challenge yourself. What are things that you are afraid to do and that you don't do because you put a label on yourself and you said, well, I'm this. You know, my name is Smith Anarula and I'm an, I'm an X and therefore I cannot do Y. We put all these labels on ourselves. I, I see a room full of people who are united by a belief who wake up every morning with compassion and commitment, and who struggle against all odds to make sure that Vermonters don't go hungry. I also see, as a collective and as individuals, deep, deep power. I believe that every single one of you has the power to be deeply, deeply transformational. And that if you do that together, that there's no stopping us. Um, and you'd be connecting with so many movements that are already taking place so what is it that I am asking you to do in addition to making this deep personal emotional commitment and shedding our labels and stepping into these roles and asking you to come together to educate. You are in such a unique position to do this. You are literally at the front lines of this struggle. Um, start by sharing your story. I feel like so much of this work is about supporting each other but we lose ourselves in the process. Why did you come to this work in the first place? What animated you? Bring yourself back into it if you haven't already. We heard from Sue last night, who just told a very profound story, brought tears to my eyes sitting back there, about, um, about what it is that made her do this work and about what it is that it calls upon all of us to do. Bring yourself back into the story. Share your story. Share other stories and encourage and empower them to share their own stories. You are at the front lines. You are already advocates and educators. Tell people about the travesty of hunger in America today. Tell them what you see and empower people to share their own stories. Educate people about SNAP. I have to put a little plug in for the Vermont Food Bank because um, people are very under, underserved by SNAP, as I understand it, in this state, and there's a lot more that can be done about enrollment. So that's something that you can do. You can help people know about it, and you can help people think of themselves as rights holders, and you can help them claim their rights. Advocate. Become an advocate. Speak up for a living wage. Speak up for a stronger social safety net. And speak up for a just food system. A broad range of individuals all over this world uniting across movements to ask for a national food policy that fixes these problems in our food system. Demand action from your representatives. And hold them accountable. We should all be holding our representatives and our economy and, and um, politicians accountable especially those who put the profit of corporations ahead of the fundamental needs of Americans. This food system stays the way that it is because of powerful lobbyists acting at the behest of agribusiness corporations who are able to mold our food systems towards profit for agribusiness instead of nourishing food for all. That's a deep injustice when we can speak up against it. And organize. We're going to be, I'm going to be leading a workshop on community empowerment and organization and talk more about this. But what we are fundamentally lacking is political will for change in this country. And how do you generate political will? Voting, <laughs> organizing, so many different organizing. The power of the people is much stronger than the people in power. And collectively and by organizing, we can we can shift we can shift consciousness and we can end hunger and poverty in our lifetime. There is tremendous power in numbers. 46 million Americans 
46 million Americans, but also the collective power of each of you. I'm imagining all of you even just connecting across sugar maple and milk and Morgan Horse. And what would it look like if you took your deep sense of commitment, your sense of justice, your compassion, and you brought it together with other people in this room? It would be incredible. I'll end by reminding us that we are part of a human rights struggle. This is not a new struggle to this country. It is a struggle that began a long time ago, and the demand for social and economic justice has been part and parcel of our civil rights struggle. We don't talk about this part of Dr. King's legacy or the civil rights movement's legacy, but Dr. King famously stated in March 1965, let us march on poverty until no American parent has to skip a meal so that their children may eat. He understood, as did the movement, that political justice and civil, civil rights have to go hand in hand with social and economic justice. Some of you may even know that in the months before his assassination, he was planning and leading a multiracial poor people's campaign, and that's an actual flyer from the campaign. We are coming to Washington, he said. We are coming to demand that the government address itself to the problem of poverty. And they did, as a multiracial movement. And that torch has been passed. Nearly 50 years later, this dream of ending poverty and hunger has been deferred for far too many Americans, but the torch has been picked up, and it's an exciting time to do this work. We are in a deep moment. We are in a frozen moment of PowerPoint. Wait, is it working now? There we go. There we go. Um, we are living in an age of resistance. You know, I started work on, on right to food in the United States um, three or four years ago, and I have to tell you, the state of the movement is night and day from even just a few years ago. We are living in an age of resistance. The number of states that have now passed um, $15 minimum wage bills and the numbers that are on the way, It is tremendously exciting. We're living in an age of resistance, and it's an exciting time to sort of do this work and to join this work. And I get to stand up here with tremendous hope and with tremendous just excitement about it because of movements that are already taking place. And these movements are also connecting and uniting, which I think is incredibly important, seeing the connections between immigrant justice, between Black Lives Matter, between economic injustice, and coming together as a planet and as a people, and also demanding a just climate, and also protecting Mother Earth, which in the, at the end is what feeds us all. It's an extremely exciting time to be engaged in this work. And it's not just about getting the government to do things, which a lot of what the Right to Food focuses on. It's also about kind of putting ourselves in the process of providing for ourselves. So what do we do? Oh wait, this is about collective action. There's also an incredible moment of collective impact that's happening. That's from a conference I spoke to two years ago where I wasn't as enthusiastic about the struggle as I am right now because our, dare I say, political revolution hadn't begun two years ago. Um, but uh, but that, was the, that was the logo of the conference. It was in the St. Louis area of food bank. There are food banks all over this country that are hungry for change use the pun, I have to use it, that are hungry for a new way of thinking about things, that are tired of, of thinking about things in terms simply as a, as a matter of charity, but are, are shifting focus much broadly to a, a matter of justice. And finally, everywhere I go, this may not be as big a deal in Vermont, but other places it is, it's to grow food everywhere. Right now, being able to lay claim and sovereignty over a piece of land, over a milk crate, and grow your own food is a radical, radical act. It is breaking and disrupting the design of our food system, and it is saying we are not outsourcing the biggest and most important daily acts that we commit for our bodies and our children and our societies, and we're taking control over that ourselves. And I've seen people do it in a lot of different places. I've seen them take over community gardens, doing guerrilla gardening, doing milk crates. What would happen if we could also empower the 46 million Americans and all the Vermonters that are coming to you to take control of the single act that determines our well-being, our health, and the health of our planet every single day? Grow food everywhere and do it as an act of resistance. It's an incredibly exciting time. I feel like Vermont is an incredible state to kind of give that message. But that is a reminder of giving that knowledge back to ourselves of how we grow our food. Because in addition to all these systemic issues that we're talking about, we also, as a society, have come to a point where we have outsourced our food production almost entirely. 
and where we have lost in that, just the knowledge of how we grow our own food and how we nourish ourselves. This is also an issue sort of, a, of sovereignty and how we reclaim those kinds of spaces in a time where the production of our food is leading to so much um, lack of health and disease and violence on the planet. I'm going to end there, but I'm also going to end just to come back to my main message for all of you, which is that the incredible work that you're all doing is nothing short of a human rights struggle. It's a struggle that's deeply connected to our nation's history of struggle for social justice, and it's also connected to contemporary human rights struggles around the country and around the world. And the world is looking to you and excited by you. It's excited to see the kinds of things that are happening in this country. I didn't come here um, with a magic bullet. Of course, we know that this work is long-term. We know it's going to take effort. I came here with a request for you to throw yourselves into it in deeply, deeply personal ways and to ask you to begin the process by a process of shifting consciousness. And I came with four little words, the right to food, and a different way of looking at things. But these aren't just words. They name an injustice, which in turn just inspires a demand for justice. A demand for the right to food is a demand for social and economic justice, for political accountability, for climate consciousness, and for a food system that is sustainable, nourishing, and just. And for a community where we can bring ourselves with love and compassion and work with another to create a society that is sustainable, nourishing, and just. And that's about all of us, not just those who are too insecure. This is very, very personal. And like all human rights struggles and victories of our time, we must begin somewhere. And I can't think of a better time or place to begin. I'm so privileged to be standing here in front of you. I'm so grateful for what you do. And I'm so grateful to have your audience to, to talk to you about these things and to join your struggle for human rights. Thank you so much.